Chapter 3, The Temptation and Fall. This chapter is based on Genesis 3. No longer free to stir up rebellion in heaven, Satan's enmity against God found a new field in plotting the ruin of the human race. In the happiness and peace of the holy pair in Eden, he beheld a vision of the bliss that to him was forever lost. Moved by envy, he determined to incite them to disobedience and bring upon them the guilt and penalty of sin. He would change their love to distrust and their songs of praise to reproaches against their Maker. Thus he would not only plunge these innocent beings into the same misery which he was himself enduring, but would cast dishonor upon God and cause grief in heaven. Our first parents were not left without a warning of the dangers that threatened them. Heavenly messengers opened to them the history of Satan's fall and his plots for their destruction, unfolding more fully the nature of the divine government, which the prince of evil was trying to overthrow. It was by disobedience to the just commands of God that Satan and his host had fallen. How important, then, that Adam and Eve should honor that law by which alone it was possible for order and equity to be maintained. The law of God is as sacred as God himself. It is a revelation of his will, a transcript of his character, the expression of divine love and wisdom. The harmony of creation depends upon the perfect conformity of all beings, of everything, animate and inanimate, to the law of the Creator. God has ordained laws for the government, not only of living beings, but of all the operations of nature. Everything is under fixed laws which cannot be disregarded. But while everything in nature is governed by natural laws, man alone, of all that inhabits the earth, is amenable to moral law. To man, the crowning work of creation, God has given power to understand his requirements, to comprehend the justice and beneficence of his law, and its sacred claims upon him, and of man, unswerving obedience is required. Like the angels, the dwellers in Eden had been placed upon probation. Their happy estate could be retained only on condition of fidelity to the Creator's law. They could obey and live, or disobey and perish. God had made them the recipients of rich blessings. But should they disregard His will, He who spared not the angels that sinned could not spare them. Transgression would forfeit His gifts and bring upon them misery and ruin. The angels warned them to be on their guard against the devices of Satan, for his efforts to ensnare them would be unwearied. While they were obedient to God, the evil one could not harm them. For, if need be, every angel in heaven would be sent to their help. If they steadfastly repelled his first insinuations, they would be as secure as the heavenly messengers. But should they once yield to temptation, their nature would become so depraved that in themselves they would have no power and no disposition to resist Satan. The tree of knowledge had been made a test of their obedience and their love to God. The Lord had seen fit to lay upon them but one prohibition as to the use of all that was in the garden. But if they should disregard his will in this particular, they would incur the guilt of transgression. Satan was not to follow them with continual temptations. He could have access to them only at the forbidden tree. Should they attempt to investigate its nature, they would be exposed to his wiles. They were admonished to give careful heed to the warning which God had sent them, and to be content with the instruction which he had seen fit to impart. In order to accomplish his work unperceived, Satan chose to employ as his medium the serpent, a disguise well adapted for his purpose of deception. The serpent was then one of the wisest and most beautiful creatures on the earth. It had wings, and while flying through the air, presented an appearance of dazzling brightness, having the color and brilliancy of burnished gold. Resting in the rich laden branches of the forbidden tree, and regaling itself with the delicious fruit, it was an object to arrest the attention and delight the eye of the beholder. Thus in the garden of peace lurked the destroyer, watching for his prey. The angels had cautioned Eve to beware of separating herself from her husband 
while occupied in their daily labor in the garden. With him she would be in less danger from temptation than if she were alone. But absorbed in her pleasing task, she unconsciously wandered from his side. On perceiving that she was alone, she felt an apprehension of danger, but dismissed her fears, deciding that she had sufficient wisdom and strength to discern evil and to withstand it. Unmindful of the angel's caution, she soon found herself gazing with mingled curiosity and admiration upon the forbidden tree. The fruit was very beautiful, and she questioned with herself why God had withheld it from them. Now was the tempter's opportunity. As if he were able to discern the workings of her mind, he addressed her, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Eve was surprised and startled, as she thus seemed to hear the echo of her thoughts. But the serpent continued in a musical voice, with subtle praise of her surpassing loveliness, and his words were not displeasing. Instead of fleeing from the spot, she lingered wonderingly to hear a serpent speak. Had she been addressed by a being like the angels, her fears would have been excited. But she had no thought that the fascinating serpent could become the medium of the fallen foe. To the tempter's ensnaring question, she replied, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. By partaking of this tree, he declared, they would attain to a more exalted sphere of existence and enter a broader field of knowledge. He himself had eaten of the forbidden fruit, and as a result had acquired the power of speech and he insinuated that the Lord jealously desired to withhold it from them, lest they should be exalted to equality with himself. It was because of its wonderful properties, imparting wisdom and power, that he had prohibited them from tasting or even touching it. The tempter intimated that the divine warning was not to be actually fulfilled. It was designed merely to intimidate them. How could it be possible for them to die? Had they not eaten of the tree of life? God had been seeking to prevent them from reaching a nobler development and finding greater happiness. Such has been Satan's work from the days of Adam to the present, and he has pursued it with great success. He tempts men to distrust God's love and to doubt his wisdom. He is constantly seeking to excite a spirit of irreverent curiosity, a restless, inquisitive desire to penetrate the secrets of divine wisdom and power. In their efforts to search out what God has been pleased to withhold, multitudes overlook the truths which he has revealed and which are essential to salvation. Satan tempts men to disobedience by leading them to believe they are entering a wonderful field of knowledge. But this is all a deception. Elated with their ideas of progression, they are, by trampling on God's requirements, setting their feet in the path that leads to degradation and death. Satan represented to the holy pair that they would be gainers by breaking the law of God. Do we not today hear similar reasoning? Many talk of the narrowness of those who obey God's commandments, while they themselves claim to have broader ideas and to enjoy greater liberty. What is this but an echo of the voice from Eden, in the day ye eat thereof? Transgress the divine requirement. Ye shall be as gods. Satan claimed to have received great good by eating of the forbidden fruit, but he did not let it appear that by transgression he had become an outcast from heaven. Though he had found sin to result in infinite loss, he concealed his own misery in order to draw others into the same position. So now the transgressor seeks to disguise his true character. He may claim to be holy, but his exalted profession only makes him the more dangerous as a deceiver. He is on the side of Satan, trampling upon the law of God and leading others to do the same to their eternal ruin. Eve really believed the words of Satan. 
but her belief did not save her from the penalty of sin. She disbelieved the words of God, and this was what led to her fall. In the judgment, men will not be condemned because they conscientiously believed a lie, but because they did not believe the truth, because they neglected the opportunity of learning what is truth. Notwithstanding the sophistry of Satan to the contrary, it is always disastrous to disobey God. We must set our hearts to know what is truth. All the lessons which God had caused to be placed on record in His Word are for our warning and instruction. They are given to save us from deception. Their neglect will result in ruin to ourselves. Whatever contradicts God's Word, we may be sure, proceeds from Satan. The serpent plucked the fruit of the forbidden tree and placed it in the hands of the half-reluctant Eve. Then he reminded her of her own words that God had forbidden them to touch it lest they die. She would receive no more harm from eating the fruit, he declared, than from touching it. Perceiving no evil results from what she had done, Eve grew bolder. When she saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. It was grateful to the taste, and as she ate, she seemed to feel a vivifying power and imagined herself entering upon a higher state of existence. Without a fear, she plucked and ate, and now, having herself transgressed, she became the agent of Satan in working the ruin of her husband. In a state of strange, unnatural excitement, with her hands filled with the forbidden fruit, she sought his presence and related all that had occurred. An expression of sadness came over the face of Adam. He appeared astonished and alarmed. To the words of Eve, he replied that this must be the foe against whom they had been warned, and by the divine sentence she must die. In answer, she urged him to eat, repeating the words of the serpent that they should not surely die. She reasoned that this must be true, for she felt no evidence of God's displeasure, but on the contrary realized a delicious, exhilarating influence, thrilling every faculty with new life, such she imagined as inspired the heavenly messengers. Adam understood that his companion had transgressed the command of God, disregarded the only prohibition laid upon them as a test of their fidelity and love. There was a terrible struggle in his mind. He mourned that he had permitted Eve to wander from his side. But now the deed was done. He must be separated from her whose society had been his joy. How could he have it thus? Adam had enjoyed the companionship of God and of holy angels. He had looked upon the glory of the Creator. He understood the high destiny open to the human race should they remain faithful to God. Yet. All these blessings were lost sight of in the fear of losing that one gift which in his eyes outvalued every other. Love, gratitude, loyalty to the Creator, all were overborne by love to Eve. She was a part of himself, and he could not endure the thought of separation. He did not realize that the same infinite power who had from the dust of the earth created him a living, beautiful form and had in love given him a companion, could supply her place. He resolved to share her fate. If she must die, he would die with her. After all, he reasoned, might not the words of the wise serpent be true? Eve was before him, as beautiful and apparently as innocent as before this act of disobedience. She expressed greater love for him than before. No sign of death appeared in her and he decided to brave the consequences. He seized the fruit and quickly ate. After his transgression, Adam at first imagined himself entering upon a higher state of existence. But soon the thought of his sin filled him with terror. The air, which had hitherto been of a mild and uniform temperature, seemed to chill the guilty pair. The love and peace which had been theirs was gone, and in its place they felt a sense of sin, a dread of the future, a nakedness of soul. The robe of light which had enshrouded them now disappeared, and to supply its place, they endeavored to fashion for themselves a covering, for
for they could not, while unclothed, meet the eye of God and holy angels. They now began to see the true character of their sin. Adam reproached his companion for her folly in leaving his side and permitting herself to be deceived by the serpent. But they both flattered themselves that he who had given them so many evidences of his love would pardon this one transgression, or that they would not be subjected to so dire a punishment as they had feared. Satan exulted in his success. He had tempted the woman to distrust God's love, to doubt his wisdom, and to transgress his law, and through her he had caused the overthrow of Adam. But the great lawgiver was about to make known to Adam and Eve the consequences of their transgression. The divine presence was manifested in the garden. In their innocence and holiness they had joyfully welcomed the approach of their Creator. But now they fled in terror and sought to hide in the deepest recesses of the garden. But the Lord God called unto Adam, and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Adam could neither deny nor excuse his sin. But instead of manifesting penitence, he endeavored to cast the blame upon his wife, and thus upon God himself. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. He who from love to Eve had deliberately chosen to forfeit the approval of God, his home in paradise, and an eternal life of joy, could now, after his fall, endeavor to make his companion and even the Creator himself responsible for the transgression. So terrible is the power of sin. When the woman was asked, What is this that thou hast done? She answered, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Why didst thou create the serpent? Why didst thou suffer him to enter Eden? These were the questions implied in her excuse for her sin. Thus, like Adam, she charged God with the responsibility of their fall. The spirit of self-justification originated in the father of lies. It was indulged by our first parents as soon as they yielded to the influence of Satan, and has been exhibited by all the sons and daughters of Adam. Instead of humbly confessing their sins, they try to shield themselves by casting the blame upon others, upon circumstances, or upon God making even his blessings an occasion for murmuring against him. The Lord then passed sentence upon the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Since it had been employed as Satan's medium, the serpent was to share the visitation of divine judgment. From the most beautiful and admired of the creatures of the field, it was to become the most groveling and detested of them all, feared and hated by both man and beast. The words next addressed to the serpent applied directly to Satan himself, pointing forward to his ultimate defeat and destruction. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Eve was told of the sorrow and pain that must henceforth be her portion. And the Lord said, Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. In the creation God had made her the equal of Adam. Had they remained obedient to God, in harmony with his great law of love, they would ever have been in harmony with each other. But sin had brought discord, and now their union could be maintained and harmony preserved only by submission on the part of the one or the other. Eve had been the first in transgression, and she had fallen into temptation by separating from her companion, contrary to the divine direction. It was by her solicitation that Adam sinned, and she was now placed in subjection to her husband. Had the principles enjoined in the law of God been cherished by the fallen race, this sentence, though growing out of the results of sin, would have proved a blessing to them. 
But man's abuse of the supremacy thus given him has too often rendered the lot of woman very bitter and made her life a burden. Eve had been perfectly happy by her husband's side in her Eden home, but like restless modern Eves, she was flattered with the hope of entering a higher sphere than that which God had assigned her. In attempting to rise above her original position, she fell far below it. A similar result will be reached by all who are unwilling to take up cheerfully their life duties in accordance with God's plan. In their efforts to reach positions for which He has not fitted them, many are leaving vacant the place where they might be a blessing. In their desire for a higher sphere, many have sacrificed true womanly dignity and nobility of character and have left undone the very work that heaven appointed them. To Adam the Lord declared, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. It was not the will of God that the sinless pair should know aught of evil. He had freely given them the good, and had withheld the evil. But contrary to his command, they had eaten of the forbidden tree, and now they would continue to eat of it. They would have the knowledge of evil all the days of their life. From that time the race would be afflicted by Satan's temptations. Instead of the happy labor heretofore appointed them, anxiety and toil were to be their lot. They would be subject to disappointment, grief and pain, and finally to death. Under the curse of sin, all nature was to witness to man of the character and results of rebellion against God. When God made man, he made him ruler over the earth and all living creatures. So long as Adam remained loyal to heaven, all nature was in subjection to him. But when he rebelled against the divine law, the inferior creatures were in rebellion against his rule. Thus, the Lord in his great mercy would show men the sacredness of his law and lead them by their own experience to see the danger of setting it aside, even in the slightest degree. And the life of toil and care, which was henceforth to be man's lot, was appointed in love. It was a discipline rendered needful by his sin, to place a check upon the indulgence of appetite and passion, to develop habits of self-control. It was a part of God's great plan for man's recovery from the ruin and degradation of sin. The warning given to our first parents, In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, did not imply that they were to die on the very day when they partook of the forbidden fruit. But on that day, the irrevocable sentence would be pronounced. Immortality was promised them on condition of obedience. By transgression, they would forfeit eternal life. That very day, they would be doomed to death. In order to possess an endless existence, man must continue to partake of the tree of life. Deprived of this, his vitality would gradually diminish until life should become extinct. It was Satan's plan that Adam and Eve should by disobedience incur God's displeasure. And then, if they failed to obtain forgiveness, he hoped that they would eat of the tree of life and thus perpetuate an existence of sin and misery. But after man's fall, holy angels were immediately commissioned to guard the tree of life. Around these angels flashed beams of light having the appearance of a glittering sword. None of the family of Adam were permitted to pass that barrier to partake of the life-giving fruit. Hence, there is not an immortal sinner. The tide of woe that flowed from the transgression of our first parents is regarded by many as too awful a consequence for so small a sin, and they impeach the wisdom and justice of God in His dealings with men. But if they could look more deeply into this question, they might discern their error. God created man after His own likeness, free from sin. 
The earth was to be peopled with beings only a little lower than the angels, but their obedience must be tested. For God would not permit the world to be filled with those who would disregard His law. Yet, in His great mercy, He appointed Adam no severe test. And the very lightness of the prohibition made the sin exceedingly great. If Adam could not bear the smallest of tests, he could not have endured a greater trial had he been entrusted with higher responsibilities. Had some great test been appointed Adam, then those whose hearts inclined to evil would have excused themselves by saying, This is a trivial matter, and God is not so particular about little things. And there would be continual transgression in things looked upon as small, and which pass unrebuked among men. But the Lord has made it evident that sin in any degree is offensive to Him. To Eve it seemed a small thing to disobey God by tasting the fruit of the forbidden tree, and to tempt her husband also to transgress. But their sin opened the floodgates of woe upon the world. Who can know in the moment of temptation the terrible consequences that will result from one wrong step? Many who teach that the law of God is not binding upon man urge that it is impossible for him to obey its precepts. But if this were true, why did Adam suffer the penalty of transgression? The sin of our first parents brought guilt and sorrow upon the world, and had it not been for the goodness and mercy of God, would have plunged the race into hopeless despair. Let none deceive themselves. The wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The law of God can no more be transgressed with impunity now than when sentence was pronounced upon the father of mankind. After their sin, Adam and Eve were no longer to dwell in Eden. They earnestly entreated that they might remain in the home of their innocence and joy. They confessed that they had forfeited all right to that happy abode, but pledged themselves for the future to yield strict obedience to God but they were told that their nature had become depraved by sin. They had lessened their strength to resist evil and had opened the way for Satan to gain more ready access to them. In their innocence they had yielded to temptation, and now, in a state of conscious guilt, they would have less power to maintain their integrity. In humility and unutterable sadness they bade farewell to their beautiful home and went forth to dwell upon the earth where rested the curse of sin. The atmosphere, once so mild and uniform in temperature, was now subject to marked changes, and the Lord mercifully provided them with a garment of skins as a protection from the extremes of heat and cold. As they witnessed in drooping flower and falling leaf the first signs of decay, Adam and his companion mourned more deeply than men now mourn over their dead. The death of the frail, delicate flowers was indeed a cause of sorrow. But when the goodly trees cast off their leaves, the scene brought vividly to mind the stern fact that death is the portion of every living thing. The Garden of Eden remained upon the earth long after man had become an outcast from its pleasant paths. The fallen race were long permitted to gaze upon the home of innocence, their entrance barred only by the watching angels. At the cherubim-guarded gate of paradise, the divine glory was revealed. Hither came Adam and his sons to worship God. Here they renewed their vows of obedience to that law, the transgression of which had banished them from Eden. When the tide of iniquity overspread the world, and the wickedness of men determined their destruction by a flood of waters, the hand that had planted Eden withdrew it from the earth. But in the final restitution, when there shall be a new heaven and a new earth, Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, it is to be restored more gloriously adorned than at the beginning. Then they that have kept God's commandments shall breathe in immortal vigor beneath the tree of life, and through unending ages the inhabitants of sinless worlds shall behold in that garden of delight a sample of the perfect work of God's creation, untouched by the curse of sin, a sample of what the whole earth would have become had man but fulfilled the Creator's glorious plan.